Welcome to Flourish. I'm Diane Planetan, and you're in the right place if you're ready to create an inspired life. And we do so by working on our own personal development. So we can be strong role models for those we love and mentor, and strong for our own mental mindset. Today is the last chapter in week 11 in my Seg 100 journey at Queen's University. So let's get going. Okay, 63 is the chapter, Personality Assessment. This module provides a basic overview to the assessment of personality. It discusses objective personality tests based on both self-report and informant ratings, projective and implicit tests, and behavioral performance measures. It describes the basic features of each method as well as reviewing the strengths, weaknesses, and overall validity of each approach. The learning objectives to keep in the back of your mind as you are reading along or perhaps listening to it on the podcast is to appreciate the diversity of methods that are used to measure personality characteristics, understand the logic, strengths, and weaknesses of each approach, and gain a better sense of the overall validity and range of applications of personality tests. As mentioned before, I am a student, not a teacher, and I'm sharing my learning journey with you because sometimes it's nice to use all your cognitive abilities when you're learning something new. So I talk out loud. (laughs) All right, let's go. Introduction. Personality is the field within psychology that studies the thoughts, feelings, behaviors, goals, and interests of normal individuals. It therefore covers a very wide range of important psychological characteristics. Moreover, different theoretical models have generated very different strategies for measuring these characteristics. For example, humanistically oriented models argue that people have clear, well-defined goals and are actively striving to achieve them. It therefore makes sense to ask them directly about themselves and their goals. In contrast, a psychodynamically oriented theories propose that people lack insight into their feelings and motives, such that their behavior is influenced by processes that operate outside of their awareness. Given that people are unaware of these processes, it does not make sense to ask directly about them. One, therefore, needs to adopt an entirely different approach to identify these non-conscious factors. Not surprisingly, researchers have adopted a wide range of approaches to measure important personality characteristics. The most widely used strategies will be summarized in the following sections. Objective tests. Definition. Objective tests represent the most familiar and widely used approach to assessing personality. Objective tests involve administering a standard set of items, each of which is answered using a limited set of response options, for example, true or false, strongly, disagree, etc. Responses to these items are then scored in a standardized, predetermined way. For example, self-ratings on items assessing talkativeness, assertiveness, sociability, and adventurousness and energy can be summed up to create an overall score on the personality trait of extroversion. It must be emphasized that the term objective refers to the method that is used to score a person's responses rather than to the responses themselves. As noted by Meyer and Kurtz in 2006, what is objective about such a procedure is that the psychologist administering the test does not need to rely on judgment to classify or interpret the test taker's response. The intended response is clearly indicated and scored according to a pre-existing key. In fact, as we will see, a person's test responses may be highly subjective and can be influenced by a number of different rating biases. Basic types of objective tests. Self-report measures. Objective personality tests can be further subdivided into two basic types. The first type, which easily is the most widely used in modern personality research, asks people to describe themselves. This approach offers two key advantages. First, self-raters have access to an unparalleled wealth of information. After all, who knows more about you than you yourself? In particular, self-raters have direct access to their own thoughts, feelings, and motives, which may not be readily available to others. Second, asking people to describe themselves is the simplest, easiest, and most cost-effective approach to assessing personalities. 
Countless studies, for instance, have involved administering self-report measures to college students who are provided some relatively simple incentive, for example, extra course credit, to participate. The items included in self-report measures may consist of single words, for example, assertive, short phrases, and full of energy, or complete sentences. I like to spend time with others. They have a table one here that presents a sample self-report measure assessing the general traits comprising the influential five-factor model of personality, neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. The sentences shown in table one are modified versions of items included in the International Personality Item Pool, which is a rich source of personality-related content in the public domain. And they have a link here I will include in the show notes. So you rate yourself and definitely take a look at this chart on the YouTube channel to get a, a better idea. But it's it's basically, I strongly agree or disagree. And number one question, for example, I'm not going to read all the questions, is I get upset easily. So then you would rate yourself. Are you strongly disagreeing with that? Or do you strongly agree? And then they sum up the following items to see how you score in different personality traits. Self-report personality tests shows impressive validity in relation to a wide range of important outcomes. For example, self-ratings of conscientiousness are significant predictors of both overall academic performance, for example, cumulative grade point average, and job performance. And a study in 2007 reported that self-rated personality predicted occupational attainment, divorce, and mortality. Similarly, a study in 2010 showed that personality ratings collected early in life were related to happiness, well-being, physical health, and mortality risk assessed several decades later. Finally, self-reported personality has important and pervasive links to psychopathology. Most notably, self-ratings of neuroticisms are associated with a wide array of clinical syndromes, including anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, substance use disorders, somatoform disorders, eating disorders, personality and conduct disorders, and schizophrenia. At the same time, however, it is clear that this method is limited in a number of ways. First, raters may not be motivated to present themselves in an overly favorable, socially desirable way. This is a particular concern in high-stakes testing that is situations in which test scores are used to make important decisions about individuals, for example, when applying for a job. Second, personality ratings reflect a self-enhancement bias. In other words, people are motivated to ignore or at least downplay some of their less desirable characteristics and to focus instead on their more positive attributes. Third, self-ratings are subject to the Reference group effect. That is, we base our self perceptions in part on how we compare to others in our social cultural reference group. For instance, if you tend to work harder than most of your friends, you will see yourself as someone who is relatively conscientious, even if you're not particularly conscientious in any absolute sense. Next is informant ratings. Another approach is to ask someone who knows a person well to describe his or her personality characteristics. In the case of children or adolescents, the informant is most likely to be a parent or teacher. In studies of older participants, informants may be friends, roommates, dating partners, spouses, children, or bosses. Generally speaking, informant ratings are similar in format to self-ratings. As was the case with self-report, items may consist of single words, short phrases, or complete sentences. Indeed, many popular instruments include parallel self and informant rating versions and is often relatively easy to convert a self-report measure so it can be used to obtain informant ratings. They have another table here that illustrates how the self-report instrument shown in Table 1 that we spoke about earlier can be converted to obtain spouse ratings, in this case having a husband describe the personality characteristics of his wife. So that's what they mean by having somebody else's perspective. And, uh, well, that's an interesting one. (laughs) Informant ratings are particularly valuable when self-ratings are impossible to collect. 
For example, when studying young children or cognitively impaired adults, or when their validity is suspect. For example, as noted earlier, people may not be entirely honest in high stakes testing situations. They also may be combined with self ratings of the same characteristics to produce more reliable and valid measures of these attributes. Informant ratings offer several advantages in comparison to other approaches to assessing personality. A well-acquainted informant presumably has had the opportunity to observe large samples of behavior in the person he or she is rating. Moreover, these judgments presumably are not subject to the types of defensiveness that potentially can distort self-ratings. Indeed, informants typically have strong incentives for being accurate in their judgments. In 1987, Funder and DeBroth put it, evaluations of the people in our social environment are central to our decisions about who to befriend and avoid, trust and distrust, hire and fire. Informant personality ratings have demonstrated a level of validity in relation to important life outcomes that is comparable to that discussed earlier for self-ratings. Indeed, they outperform self-ratings in certain circumstances, particularly when the assessed traits are highly evaluated in nature, for example, intelligence, charm, creativity. For example, O et al. in 2011 found that informant ratings were more strongly related to job performance than were self-ratings. Similarly, a study in 2009 summarized evidence indicating that informant ratings of Air Force cadets predicted early involuntary discharge from the military better than self-ratings. Nevertheless, informant ratings are also subject to certain problems and limitations. One general issue is the level of relevant information that is available to the rater. For instance, even under the best circumstances, informants lack full access to the thoughts, feelings, and motives of the person they are rating. This problem is magnified when the informant does not know the person particularly well and or sees him or her in a limited range of situations. Informant ratings are also subject to some of the same response biases noted earlier for self-ratings. For instance, they are not immune to the reference group effect. Indeed, it is well established that parent ratings are often subject to a sibling contrast effect, such that parents exaggerate the true magnitude of differences between their children. Furthermore, in many studies, individuals are allowed to nominate or even recruit the informants who will rate them. Because of this, it is most often the case that informants, who as noted earlier, may be friends, relatives, or romantic partners, like the people they are rating. This in turn means that informants may produce overly favorable personality ratings. Indeed, their ratings actually can be more favorable than the corresponding self-ratings. This tendency for informants to produce unrealistically positive ratings has been termed the letter of recommendation effect and the honeymoon effect when applied to newlyweds. Other ways of classifying objective tests. Comprehensiveness. In addition to the source of the scores, there are at least two other important dimensions on which personality tests differ. The first such dimension concerns the extent to which an instrument seeks to assess personality in a reasonably comprehensive manner. At one extreme, many widely used measures are designed to assess a single core attribute. Examples of these types of measures include the Toronto Alexithemia scale the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, and the multidimensional experiential avoidance questionnaire. At the other extreme, a number of omnibus inventories contain a large number of specific scales and purport to measure personality in a reasonably comprehensive manner. These instruments include the California Psychological Inventory, the revised Hexago Personality Inventory, the Multidimensional Personality Questionnaire, the NEO Personality Inventory, the Personality Research Form, and the 16 Personality Factor Questionnaire. Breadth of Target Characteristics. Second, personality characteristics can be classified at different levels of breadth or generality. For example, many models emphasize broad, big traits such as neuroticism and extroversion. 
These general dimensions can be divided up into several distinct yet empirically correlated component traits. For example, the broad dimension of extroversion contains such specific component traits as dominance. Extroverts are assertive, persuasive, and exhibitionistic. Sociability. Extroverts seek out and enjoy the company of others. Positive emotionality. Extroverts are active, energetic, cheerful, and enthusiastic, and adventurous. Extroverts enjoy intense, exciting experiences. Some popular personality instruments are designed to assess only the broad general traits. For example, similar to the sample instrument displayed in Table 1, the Big Five inventory contains brief scales assessing the broad traits of neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. In contrast, many instruments, including several of the omnibus inventories mentioned earlier, were designed primarily to assess a large number of more specific characteristics. Finally, some inventories, including the hexaco-pi-r and the neo-pi-3, were explicitly designed to provide coverage of both general and specific trait characteristics. For instance, the neo Dash PI dash three contains six specific facet scales. For example, gregariousness, assertiveness, positive emotions, excitement seeking, that then can be combined to assess the broad trait of extroversion. Next is projective and implicit tests. Projective tests. As noted earlier, some approaches to personality assessment are based on the belief that important thoughts, feelings, and motives operate outside of conscious awareness. Projective tests represent influential and early example of this pr- approach. Projective tests originally were based on the projective hypotheses. If a person is asked to describe or an interpret ambiguous stimuli, that is, things that can be understood in a number of different ways, their responses will be influenced by non-conscious needs, feelings, and experiences. Note, however, that the theoretical rationale underlining these measures has evolved over time. Two prominent examples of projective tests are the Rorschach inkblot test from 1921 and the thematic apperception test from 1935. The former asked respondents to interpret symmetrical blots of ink, whereas the latter asked them to generate stories about a series of pictures. For instance, one TAT, which is the thematic apperception test picture, depicts an elderly woman with her back turned to a young man. The latter looks downward with a somewhat perplexed expression. Another picture displays a man clutched from behind by three mysterious hands. What stories could you generate in response to these pictures? In comparison to objective tests, projective tests tend to be somewhat cumbersome and labor-intensive to administer. The biggest challenge, however, has been to develop a reliable and valid scheme to score the extensive set of responses generated by each respondent. The most widely used Rochash scoring scheme is a comprehensive system developed by Exner in 2003. The most influential TAT scoring system was developed by McClelland Atkinson and colleagues between 1947 and 1953. The validity of the Rorschach has been a matter of considerable controversy. Most reviews acknowledge that Rorschach scores do show some ability to predict important outcomes. Its critics, however, argue that it fails to provide important incremental information beyond other, more easily acquired information such as that obtained from standard self-report measures. Validity evidence is more impressive for the TAT. In particular, reviews have concluded that TAT-based measures of the need for achievement, A, show significant validity to predict important criteria, and B, provide important information beyond that obtained from objective measures of this motive. Furthermore, given the relatively weak associations between objective and projective measures of motives, McClelland et al. in 1989 argue that they tap somewhere different processes with the latter assessing implicit motives. Next is implicit tests. 
In recent years, researchers have begun to use implicit measures of personality. These tests are based on the assumption that people form automatic or implicit associations between certain concepts based on their previous experience and behavior. If two concepts, for example, me and assertive, are strongly associated with each other, then they should be sorted together more quickly and easily than two concepts, for example, me and shy, that are less strongly associated. Although validity evidence for these measures still is relatively sparse, the results to date are encouraging. Back at all in 2009, for example, showed that implicit measures of the FFM personality traits predicted behavior even after controlling for scores on objective measures of these same characteristics. Next is behavioral and performance measures. A final approach is to infer important personality characteristics from direct samples of behaviors. For example, in 1988, Funder and Colvin brought opposite sex pairs of participants into the laboratory and have them engage in five-minute getting acquainted conversation. Raiders watched videotapes of these interactions and then scored the participants on very personality characteristics. In 2006, as another study used the electronically activated recorder, or EAR, to obtain samples of ambient sounds in the participants' natural environments over a period of two days. EAR-based scores then were related to self- and observer-rated measures of personality. For instance, more frequent talking over this two-day period was significantly related to both self- and observer ratings of extroversion. As a final example, Gosling, Coleman, Raleigh, and Morris in 2002 sent observers in to college students' bedrooms and then had them rate the students' personality characteristics on the big five traits. The averaged observer ratings correlated significantly with participants' self-ratings on all five traits. Follow-up analysis indicated that conscientious students had neater rooms, where those who were high in openness to experience had a wider variety of books and magazines. Behavioral measures offer several advantages over other approaches to assessing personality. First, because behavior is sampled directly, this approach is not subject to the types of responses biases, for example, self-enhancement bias, reference group effect that can distort scores on objective tests. Second, as is illustrated by the Mel et al. 2006 and Gosling et al. 2002 studies, this approach allows people to be studied in their daily lives and in their natural environments, thereby avoiding the artificiality of other methods. Finally, this is the only approach that actually assesses what people do as opposed to what they think or feel. At the same time, however, this approach also has some disadvantages. This assessment strategy clearly is much more cumbersome and labor-intensive than using objective tests, particularly self-report. Moreover, similar to projective tests, behavioral measures generate a rich set of data that they need to be scored in a reliable and valid way. Finally, even the most ambitious study only obtains relatively small samples of behavior that may provide a somewhat distorted view of a person's true characteristics. For example, your behavior during a getting acquainted conversation on a single given day inevitably will reflect a number of transient influences, for example, level of stress, quality of sleep, the previous night, that are idiosyncratic to that day. In conclusion, no single method of assessing personality is perfect or infallible. Each of the major methods has both strengths and limitations. By using a diversity of approaches, researchers can overcome the limitations of any single method and develop a more complete and integrative view of personality. Well, I really enjoyed that. And yes, as humans, we want to portray ourselves in a best possible light, right? I, I don't know uh, these personality tests. There's so many different ones that it's hard to know which is really the most effective. Well, if you like the show, share it with somebody you know, and I hope you're learning as much about psychology basics as I am. And maybe hit that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, whatever you have time for.
I am always grateful for hearing from the universal community we have in the world. It's so much fun and it's it's really quite uh, enlightening to be able to share all of this information with you to help you, to help each other. I'm helping myself here right now too, because I'm learning by talking out loud and then I can go back and listen and then I can reread and then I can form some questions, which is helping to encode and plant the information into my, you know, remembering <laughs> mechanism <laughs> because we're all here for a reason. And I really want to help you help yourself to live a more inspired life.